Chapter 46, Part 1 Holding Vivian against him, once again, was everything that Gregory wanted it to be. She satisfied longings in him that he didn't even realize he felt until she fulfilled them. Would to God that she would never know how close he had in fact come to obeying her wishes and going away again for good. The entire enterprise had been a hair's breadth from failure, but then his persistence had paid off, and here they were, together once more. I have run all over the earth looking for you, beloved, he thought, and now I find with you once again that feeling that I thought I would never know again, the sensation of home. Let us never be apart again. He looked down at her face and saw where she had aged, saw the faint map of fine lines at the corners of her eyes. But the loveliness was there just the same. Her hair had lost its elfin bluish shine, he noticed, and was an unusual new shade, and smelled like it used to, but also like some kind of chemical scent that had to be related to the hair color. He thought about it for a moment, wondering if he missed her old hair color, and then quickly decided that he couldn't care less. To have her back, to have her still be alive, and to want him, these were the supremely important things. Everything else was negotiable. Her body felt small and slight, had it always been so? He already knew from having seen her at the Garden Club event that she was still beautiful, but now he could really look at her up close. She looked lovely, and she made sleeping look like a marvelous thing. It made him more than a tinge jealous. The comfort of her nearness was almost overwhelming, and he longed to press his face against the curve in her neck to be closer to her, and to rest there for a while. There was no rest for him for long, once she fell asleep, however. He began to be conscious of her in a way that aroused his predatory nature, and even though he tried closing his eyes and sitting as still as possible and letting his mind relax so that he could linger and hold her to him for longer, nonetheless, Certain hungers increasingly reasserted themselves in him until they finally forced him reluctantly from her side. Oh, I desire you too much, beloved, he thought. He wondered if he should carry her up the stairs to her bed, but then he thought that he wanted to remain a blameless gentleman and did not want to presume by passing over the threshold of her bedchamber again until she made it clear what kind of a relationship exactly they were going to have. Instead, he helped her to stretch out, turn the lights off, except for a small table lamp in the corner, put a sofa cushion beneath her head, and covered her with a soft throw blanket that was on the small armchair. He recognized the armchair as being the one that they had sat in together all those years ago, when he had come to say goodbye to her before she left with Chip for New York. Reupholstered once again, after the reupholstering that it had received two decades earlier from him, he looked around the room, which she was filling with the soft, even sound of her breathing. He moved through the bottom floor of her house, looking at everything closely and with great interest, periodically coming back to gaze at her, being unable to pull himself away from her somehow. Her house was large and spacious, but it did not have many items of furniture in it, a sign of someone moving from a smaller place into a much larger one, and without the belongings to quite fill it. The plant stand he had bought for her stood there. The dishes he had bought for her were in the kitchen cabinet, and many other items from him were to be seen. 
There were very few books of any kind that he could see. Perhaps she kept a few more upstairs? There was a large television cabinet in the living room. Well, that would have to go. He certainly had no plans to share her with that. Photographs of Sophie stood in small frames on the end table in the hall. She was blonde and stunning. Vivian was right. And he blushed to think that if he had come across her circa 1920 in New Orleans, he would have invited her out to the theater for certain. Her wedding picture was a bit disturbing to Gregory. What with a man who reminded Gregory of himself standing there beside her. Heavens, was that intentional? He gulped. In the dining room on the other side of the foyer, there was a fine wooden table and chairs and a sideboard cabinet on which was a wrapped package and an envelope that Vivian had apparently addressed to someone named Daniel, the sunshine of my life. Vivian hadn't mentioned another man. Hmm. Well, whoever this Daniel was, he could take his solar glow and cast it over someone else now, thought Gregory. She is mine, and I will never be parted from her again. He looked up the stairs, refrained from walking up to see the second story, circled back again into the living room, where Vivian's peaceful breathing assured him that everything was well. And then he looked out into the darkness outside and saw his car in Vivian's driveway. Now I should move that before I start any rumors in this small town, he thought. And he went out and moved the car from her home's driveway to the store parking area. It was not much of a help, but it was better than nothing. He did not want to travel anywhere further, lest she wake up while he was out and worry that he had left her. He also wisely carried a spare white shirt in the trunk of his car, a practicality which came in handy sometimes during his evening runs and sometimes messy scrapes. He pulled that out now and went into the house to change his shirt, carrying back outside the shirt that Vivian had cried all over. Coming back into the house, he checked on her once more and kissed her sleeping face and then went into the kitchen. A sound he did not expect startled him and then he realized that he was not alone in the kitchen. A second creature had just entered it, a small creature with a fast heartbeat. He looked down and saw the large, frightened eyes of a small cat. Oh, so Vivian had a pet. The small flap door was still slightly moving where the animal had pushed through into the kitchen from outside. Gregory knelt down and carefully reached out a hand, but the creature hissed and set all of its fur to standing. He thought it would run away, but it seemed to be waiting for Gregory to scram. I'm sorry, little fellow but the woman I love has let me stay, so you will just have to put up with it, he said to the agitated animal. The cat seemed to understand because he growled low, gave Gregory a look that would curdle milk, and then banged back out through the flap door. With the kitchen entirely to himself once more, Gregory sat down in a chair and counted himself down for a long meditation. Being with her, when he was already with her, was a kind of double-dipping into blessing. And once again, the comfort of it reached into his very bones. Once or twice, she made a small sound, and he moved silently back to the living room to check on her. But she remained fast asleep. Around morning... He stepped out of her back door into her garden and sat in a nearby wooden Adirondack chair and watched the sunrise, blissfully replaying over and over in his mind how she had told him that she would belong to him. It was all 
that he had ever wanted. Lost in his thoughts, it took him a while to actually notice her garden, and when he did, he saw that it was stunning. It was laid out with traditional brick paths, and was so like his mother's garden that he could hardly believe it. The layout was not the same, but the feeling in it was similar. How could she have known what that garden had been like? There were the recognizable leaves of the daffodils and irises. There were the rose bushes, and there were azaleas and other plants. He could recognize them by their leaves, but there were no flowers on most of them, since it was now going on October. Under one of the bushes was the small cat, and it shot out like a startled creature when he got near. It raced into the house, from whence it promptly departed again when Gregory walked back in. The sound of the back door opening must have woken Vivian, because she was moving under the blanket and yawning. He came to the living room, leaned against the door frame, and watched her wake, smiling to himself. Oh, but he loved her so much. She sat up and rubbed her eyes, looking confused and probably wondering why she had spent the night on her sofa instead of in her bed. Then her eyes caught sight of him. She blushed, shy and embarrassed. Good morning, Gregory, she told him. Good morning, beloved, he replied, peeling himself away from the door frame to walk over to her. But she turned away and drew the small blanket protectively about herself. He stopped. She wanted him no closer right now. Last night may have been very passionate at moments, and they had shortcut to a place of complete closeness and joy, but it did not change the fact that they had a lot of rebuilding to do in their relationship, and that that would take time. She would decide when they might be ready to come closer again for good. Gregory took a deep breath and told himself that that was not a problem for him, as time was the one thing that he had plenty of. I... Were you here all night? she asked him. Yes, he said. I held you for as long as I could, and then I went into the kitchen. Your house is very quiet and peaceful. It must be wonderful to live out in the country like this. I need to go and get in the shower. I must look a real fright, she said self-consciously. She stood up. Oh, heavens! Was your car in front of my house all night? What will people think? She cried, walking over to the window. He laughed. You needn't worry about your reputation. I moved it to the front of the store during the night. By the way, I met your fellow boarder, the small gray cat. Oh, yes, that's whiskey, Vivian said, turning away from the window and looking over to Gregory on the other end of the room. Whiskey? echoed Gregory. Well, I have always liked whiskey, but this whiskey did not like me. I think he considered biting me, but then thought the better of it. He will come around to liking you. I'm sure of it, said Vivian with a smile. And then she went upstairs to wash and dress. Gregory went into the kitchen and waited for her. After a while, he wondered if he should make her tea or coffee or something, but he did not know where she kept those things. He opened the refrigerator and tried to identify the things in it. Most of the containers did not look like any kind of food that he remembered from his food-consuming life. A weird, longish rectangular box turned out unexpectedly to have eggs in it. He wished he knew how to cook eggs. He sighed. Why the sighing? she asked him as she came into the kitchen. She was wearing a plaid skirt with a cream-colored cardigan sweater, and she looked very elegant, if thin. Her glasses made her look more serious and thoughtful than ever, 
which he secretly adored. Oh, I was just thinking that I wish I knew how to make eggs, he said, so that I could make some for you. What kind of eggs? she asked suspiciously. Whatever kind you eat, he replied happily. Oh, Vivi, I want to learn everything with you. I can't wait to get started. Oh, don't take this the wrong way, but I'm not sure that I would want to eat anything that you might cook, she told him. And I would also need to review my homeowner's fire insurance policy first. I am hurt, he said. But not discouraged, he smiled brightly. When was the last time you cooked anything? she asked him. Well, it has been a while, he admitted. All right, you have a point there. But I could probably make coffee or tea. Where do you keep those things? Tea in the mornings, she said to him, and then she showed him where everything for the making of tea could be found. Whiskey, the small cat, stuck his head through the tiny flap door and gave Gregory an angry glare. Oh, yes, and Whiskey's breakfast consists of this, Vivian said, pointing to cans of cat food on a shelf. She opened a can, put its contents into a small bowl, and handed the bowl to Gregory. Here, you give it to him. That way you two can start to make friends. Gregory did as he was told. The cat was torn between expressing his disdain for his new breakfast server and his hunger for his breakfast. He ended up cleverly meeting both objectives by walking around the bowl and sitting down with his rear end to Gregory. It was hard not to laugh at this small, fluffy, haughty creature. Gregory finished with the tea, poured a cup for Vivian, poured himself a hand-warming cup also, and then they sat down in the sunshine at Vivian's kitchen table while she ate a small breakfast that seemed to be the same size as what Gregory had just fed whiskey. So what did you do after... after I... after you jumped... after you left? Vivian began awkwardly. Oh, many things, Vivi. I will tell you all about it. Let's talk about all that in the afternoon, when we have more time, he said. She nodded and took a bite of her food. Your hair is different, he said to her. Yes, this is one of the delights of aging, she said sarcastically between bites. I mean, you look lovely. I like it, he said quickly. You changed your hairstyle, too, she said. Well, yes, people were beginning to stare at me. I got rid of my pocket watch, too, because I was starting to look like a caricature or someone coming out of a cheap costume shop. But if you don't care for my hair this way, I will wear it any way you like, he told her. No, it looks good, she said quickly. All of you looks pretty good, actually. The only problem is that you look like you're maybe eighteen. Are you sure you haven't unaged since I saw you last? You look like a boy. But handsome, he countered with a smile. Vivian took a sip of her tea. I wouldn't brag about that, she said. It adds to your whole look in an unhelpful way. Ah, a boy. And me heading toward fifty. Gregory laughed gently. Now that I'm well over one hundred years old, isn't it only suitable that the woman I am with be at least fifty? It seems fitting to me. But not to me, young boy, she said. He put his teacup down. Stop right there, Vivian. Never call me a young boy. A man's ego can only take so much. Do not forget that I am not what I look to be. I am far older than you, so please keep it in mind. I have known you since you were no taller than my thigh, and had lived a few lifetimes even before that. Do not misjudge me. Others will misjudge, and will not understand, Vivian replied. 
and he could hear the worry in her voice. I hate how people will judge me for having a younger man. Do you think it was different for me when you were sixteen? he asked. I was probably seen as an odious older man, preying on your innocence. How was that fair to us? How was that fair to me? People should not be so quick to judge what they do not understand. How is it that I have been moral and upstanding and have faithfully loved the same woman more or less my whole life, yet she either is too young or too old for me, and my intentions are always called into question? I refuse to play at this game. He swallowed his irritation, reached across the table for her hand, bent his head down, and kissed the top of her fingers. Forget others, he said more gently. Their opinion doesn't matter. She waited until he returned her hand to her, and then she finished her small breakfast. You gave a fantastic speech to the garden club, Madam President, he told her. Do you really think so? she asked, looking up from her plate. I'm so glad that I decided to come. I was incredibly proud of you, he said, smiling. Thank you, she said, half shyly. Then, changing the subject, she asked, I meant to ask you yesterday, why all the flowers last week? I am a florist, you know, and I own a whole store full of them. Well, yes, but I thought maybe you never really got flowers yourself, and that that might be special to you, he replied. That is true, she admitted. There have not been very many flowers for me of late. It was a sweet, if overdone, gesture. As an unfortunate side effect, however, my store assistant is terrified of you now. Why, I was too good of a customer, you mean, he grinned. No, she asked me who you were, and I said you were a deranged family member from the South, Vivian replied. Deranged? Well, how do I deserve that? he asked, feigning a hurt tone of voice. You put down as the occasion the wooing of a very stubborn woman. What was I supposed to do with that, pray tell? she challenged. He laughed. Yes, perhaps I got a bit carried away there, he admitted. But not to the point of being deranged. I did not go as far as deranged. I stand my ground. Then he looked at his watch. So what will we do today? What do you usually do on days like today? What is your daily life like? Where do you go? What do you do? Show me everything. I want to see your entire world, he told her enthusiastically. Well, on Saturday mornings, I go grocery shopping, she said. Have you ever even seen the inside of a grocery store? Not recently. Let's go. Oh, an exotic adventure, he cried. I can't wait. No one but you would consider grocery shopping exotic, Vivian told him. But she smiled as she said it, so he knew that it was all right. Gregory pointed outside. It is a nice day. Let's take my car, he said. Vivian gave him a doubtful look. Your car? I certainly hope you drive better than you used to bicycle, she told him. First it's my cooking you were disparaging, and now it's my driving, he laughed. I will try not to feel too badly about it. Come on, see how I do. And if you approve and you need a floral delivery boy, perhaps you will consider me for the post? Vivian sighed. You were always wasted in the role of delivery boy. You have the potential to be so much more than that. With you, I think I will be yet, he said. I recommend you bring a scarf for your hair. I wouldn't want the wind to destroy your coiffure. She gave him an oh-come-now look over the tops of her glasses, pulled a corner of a scarf out of her pocketbook, and then she gathered her other belongings. He motioned with his upturned hat toward the front door, which he held open for her. 
Vivian looked at his hat. Hats are out of vogue, she said definitively. I'm an eccentric country gentleman, and I wear one, he said. Gregory, you are much too young to be an eccentric country gentleman, she told him. What, does the shrapnel in my leg from the Great War mean nothing, then? he jested. She gave him a dry look. Shrapnel is also out of vogue, she told him, sailing out through the open front door. Why do you drive a convertible? she asked as they walked through the grass and beneath the apple trees to the small flower shop parking area where his white car was waiting. How very stylish and modern of you. Why is it white, though? A white convertible up here. In New York you must be a rare sight in that. Everyone drove white automobiles in Florida, he shrugged. It isn't a new one, but I bought it from a mechanic who kept it in excellent shape. It's a Studebaker Lark 8 convertible. I think of convertibles as more old-fashioned and open-air than regular automobiles, more like I am used to from the past. Like when you are on horseback. I understand, she said. I didn't ride for years and years, he confessed to her as he opened her door for her and helped her into the car. I like that things are being increasingly built to my taller proportions, though. That is one thing that I like better and better as the world moves into the future. Every vehicle I buy seems to have an increasing amount of legroom for me. People are getting taller. I heard about that on the news, said Vivian. The downside is that soon I will not stand out at all then, he laughed. Oh, I think you have nothing to worry about on that front, she said, looking over at him. Now where to, my queen? he asked as he rolled off the roof canopy and started the engine. To the stop and shop. I will give you directions, she said. You may as well see local Connecticut grocery shopping at its grandest. The grocery store turned out to be an extravaganza of food display in quantities and varieties that Gregory had never imagined existed. His lower jaw hung a bit slack as he surveyed the rows of store shelves. The produce department was an explosion of colors and types of fruits and vegetables. He was fairly certain that most of these edible things hadn't even been invented back when he might still have consumed them. Vivian opened her pocketbook and pulled out a small notebook and a pencil. "'Oh, I have one of those, too!' exclaimed Gregory, pointing at her notebook. "'A grocery list?' she said, eyebrows arched. "'I think not.' She looked down at the list and then grabbed a metal cart on wheels, and they begin walking through the store. It was a very exotic experience, without a doubt. Some of the items that Vivian was buying seemed so odd to Gregory that he had to stop and ask her to explain what they were. Other items just made no sense at all. You buy breadcrumbs? In a can? he asked her. Why? I would think that breadcrumbs would be, well, a naturally occurring material, you might say, in a household that consumes bread. Aren't you being taken for a sucker? I've never heard of anyone buying crumbs before. Vivian laughed. It is funny when you put it like that, she admitted. But the buying of breadcrumbs is commonly done. Fewer useful crumbs accumulate around my kitchen than you might think. For one thing, I often buy pre-sliced bread. Pre-sliced bread? echoed Gregory. Why? He shook his head. It was hopeless. The world of mortal cuisine had long ago surpassed his understanding. He smiled, and henceforth just calmly pulled down from the taller shelves anything that Vivian wanted to buy. She could have pointed to a giraffe carcass and he would have wordlessly placed it into the metal cart. 
They headed towards the cashier, with more food items than he thought that a family of seven might need for a week, against which Vivian's extremely modestly sized breakfast contrasted illogically. There were flower bouquets for sale up by the cashier, and Gregory pulled one out of its water bucket and added it to their shopping cart. "'You do realize that you are supporting one of my competitors by buying these here,' Vivian pointed out. He laughed. "'Oh, don't be so literal, my love,' he told her. And then he paid for everything and helped her get it out to the parking lot. They were loading everything into the trunk of his car when a woman came over to them and began speaking with Vivian. "'Oh, and who is this?' she inquired, giving Gregory one of those sweeping head-to-toe glances that he did not particularly care for. "'Oh, uh, yes, he's—he's he's visiting family from the South,' Vivian quickly explained. "'My aunt's brother's grandson, once removed, maybe twice—' It was all he could do to not laugh at her panic. Gallantly, he came to her rescue. He pointed to his wristwatch, which he was still getting used to. "'We need to get ourselves removed, or we will never make it on time,' he said to Vivian. "'Ooh, where are you going?' asked the strange, wide-eyed woman. This was a very annoying person. Gregory cut his good humor short. "'To a funeral, madame,' he said with a stern frown. "'Now if you will excuse us,' he said as he brushed past, and he opened the door for Vivian and helped her into the car. "'Oh, jeez, my condolences. Uh, so sorry,' babbled the woman. "'But groceries?' "'It is followed by a potluck wake,' Vivian told her. "'The family is cooking to save on catering.' The woman made a shocked face. Gregory ignored her stepped back around, got into the driver's side, slapped his door firmly shut, and then they drove away. Great! So now everyone in town will know that I was seen out and about with a handsome young boy half my age. Ugh! That was Susan Spires, one of the most useless Garden Club members that we have, grumbled Vivian. Why a funeral? I don't look dressed for one. "'But I do,' said Gregory blithely. "'And if she had kept up with her inquiries, it could have been her funeral.' "'Oh, we can't go around killing all of the annoying people, Gregory,' Vivian told him matter-of-factly. "'Very few people would be left, and my flower shop would definitely go out of business.' "'Oh, I hadn't considered it from that angle,' he admitted. "'Still, it is going to be a problem to introduce you to anyone. What am I supposed to say?' "'That you are what, exactly?' Vivian rubbed her fingers above her eyebrows. "'Say I'm family,' he said easily. "'No one needs any more information than that. "'Or say that I'm your latest lover "'and you woke up in bed with me earlier today "'and let them all suck raw eggs. "'I don't really care.' Back at home, Vivian ate a small refreshment and then made a strange meat pudding using eggs and spices and the breadcrumbs. Then she stuffed the whole mush into a baking tin. The smell of the raw meat made Gregory feel slightly lightheaded, and he thought that the meat pudding looked like something that had already been eaten once by someone else and had come back up again, but he kept his opinion to himself. The whole thing went into the oven, and in a short amount of time, interesting and more pleasant smells began to fill the kitchen. Ah, how odd, he sighed. The smell of food and spices. Come outside with me, Vivian told him. It will be a while before the meatloaf finishes baking. He obediently followed her outside, where she gave him a tour of her garden in the sunshine. And here are my kitchen herbs, she told him. Try this one. It is coriander. She tore off a few leaves, rubbed them between her fingers, and lifted up her hand for him to smell the fragrance. It was a refreshing smell, bright and friendly, and unlike any sensory experience 
that Gregory had had in many years. Here, chew on them, she said. I can't eat leaves, Vivi, he protested. No, don't swallow them, just chew them, so that you can see what they smell like inside your mouth. Then spit them out, Vivian told him. I may be odd, but I don't smell with my mouth, he told her. Your mouth and your nose are connected in the back, you know, she said. Try it. He took the few small leaves from her and put them in his mouth, trying to figure out how to chew them. It was such a strange experience. And suddenly he thought he could pull up a memory from his boyhood, eating food with his brother and sister. The taste was gentle and sweet. Tears stung his eyes. He daintily spit out the leaves. Oh, how wonderful, he exclaimed. She smiled at him. And here, this one is spearmint. Totally different, see? She crushed a few leaves between her fingers, let him smell them, and then he tried chewing those. Oh, that such experience could still exist in this world. He was awestruck, almost to the point of tears. She gave him some parsley, and then rosemary next, explaining that it was not the season any more for dill or fennel or basil or several other herbs. We will taste those in the spring and summer then, he said to her, catching her fingers and kissing her hand. You will come to visit me again in the spring and summer, she asked, and he could read the vulnerability in her eyes. Did she really imagine that he would just vanish again after everything? Of course I will come to visit you again then, he said. He wanted to suggest that he'd just come to live with her now, but that did seem a bit too forward, seeing that they had just resumed their friendship less than twenty-four hours ago. He did not want to frighten her. "'Your garden is very beautiful, although it is still so new,' he said. "'It reminds me of another once, a more established one, long ago.' "'Does it?' she asked looking away to the edges of the garden and trying to sound nonchalant about it, but he could tell that she cared. It does. You know, I think the very best of nature can be found in cultivated gardens. They have a genteel beauty, unlike the wilderness and its untamed nature. I have seen, and probably become, too much of the rough side of nature to naively imagine that it is all beautiful. The cultivated garden is the best of nature, adapted to our kinder souls and hearts. We do not plant one kind of flower on top of another and then let them fight it out for survival in the soil. No, we uproot and push back against the rude invasion of the weeds. In short, the garden is an idealized place. Is it any wonder that I feel at home in it? Gregory told Vivian. So, no camping? Vivian asked, gently mocking him. Well, look, dearest, anyone who has had to spend as many weeks involuntarily camping in the forests of Georgia and Tennessee as I have would understandably never want to sleep outdoors again. Then Gregory grinned. Maybe at the Waldorf Astoria? "'What is it with you and luxury hotels?' she asked. "'You're a snob, that's it.' "'Probably,' he admitted. "'I love to be surrounded by beautiful things, "'but I don't feel the need to actually own them, "'so a hotel serves just fine. "'It is the calm and uplifting, man-made, elegant environment "'that I think I crave and that I so deeply appreciate.' "'Nothing in nature thrills you?' she wanted to know. He smiled. "'Oh, some things do. Probably water, great heights, the delicacy of flowers, and the canopy of stars. Perfect, 
and perfectly beautiful, even by the standards of the most demanding aesthete, he told her softly. They spent their time out in the garden until the meatloaf was just about ready, and then they went inside, and Vivian finished making the other items to accompany the main course. Let's eat in the dining room to celebrate, she suggested. I love celebrating, he told her happily, and he helped her carry everything to the dining table. His eye fell on the package for Daniel, lying there on the sideboard. He walked over and pretended to see it for the first time. Oh, who is this Daniel? he asked casually. I, uh, well, Vivian squirmed. She set down her water glass and utensils around her plate that Gregory had brought in for her. She seemed very uncomfortable suddenly. His heart skipped a beat. Was this some other man who was in her life then? Vivian, he said in a low voice. I'm not entirely unrealistic, and you know that. I have never been opposed to you having another man in your life, and it's even all right now, as long as he doesn't come first with you, he told her. Vivian sat down and made a slight choking sound, clutching at her water glass and downing half of it in one go. No, Daniel is not some other man in my life, she said at last, hoarsely. I... Oh, this is so awkward. What could be more awkward right now than that you have another man? asked Gregory, sitting down across from her, and wondering if this was going to be a very uncomfortable conversation. That I have a grandson, she finally blurted out. You... What? asked Gregory in surprise. Yes, I'm a grandmother, all right, she muttered. More time has passed than you realize, Gregory Morgan. I'm so old that I'm a grandmother. Gregory paused for a moment and then broke into a broad smile. Sophie's child, he asked. That is wonderful, Vivian. Congratulations to you all. It is a great blessing, and I am very glad to hear it. He gave her a tender look. I don't care if you're a grandmother or a great-grandmother. You aren't my great-grandmother, after all. It doesn't change how I feel about you. Do not let it bother you one bit. And may I add that you look extremely fetching for a grandmother, especially in that very un-grandmother-like skirt. She made a face, but he could see that she was a bit soothed. They spent the rest of the meal talking about her house and garden, and what work she had put into it, a topic that he thought was emotionally neutral enough to restore her comfort with him. After she finished her food, they walked upstairs, and she showed him all of the rooms on the second floor. Her bedroom was sparsely furnished, and felt very comfortable and clean. The decorative pillows that he had given her for her apartment long ago now old and very worn, were on her bed. She has held on to every single thing from me, he realized, and his heart gave a tender squeeze. He looked around the rest of the modestly sized room. What is this? he asked, pointing to the pre dieu under the window. Oh, that is where I say my prayers each day. I usually say them in the morning, but I didn't get too far with that today, so I will probably say them tonight before I go to bed. I always pray for you also, you know, she told him. As I do for you, he told her. I think I do something similar to what you do, only I don't have one of these. I met a guru who taught me to meditate. Some of the hippies do that, I've heard, said Vivian. Do you find it helpful? Vivi, it saved me, he told her honestly. I wouldn't have been able to come back and find you again without it. He wanted to reach for her 
and put his arms around her then, but she moved away toward the window, so he dropped his arms to his sides again. He knew that he had to wait until she was ready to come close to him again, and the more motionless he could be, the more likely it was that this butterfly would become unafraid and would land on him again. She probably hadn't had too many people putting their arms about her of late, and it would take some time to regrow that trust. Well, he was in no hurry. Take all the time you need, beloved, he thought. She turned around to look at him. It is so strange to see you here in these rooms, among all of my things, she told him. Well, why is that? he wanted to know. Well, I have seen the ghostly shadow of you so often in my house, she explained. That room down there is the one I imagined as yours. Downstairs in the living room, the larger armchair is the one I imagined you sitting in when I was on the sofa. One specific kitchen chair is always yours, and one dining chair also. On the porch, you have the rocking chair on the right. Mmm, he said, stepping closer to the window and looking out onto the garden with her. And in the garden? You get that Adirondack chair, she said, pointing to it. You have thought of me with you in all of these places, he asked, awed. She nodded, and he was struck by the confession of extreme loneliness and unexpected dreaminess that she was revealing in this. Was this his practical Vivian? Do you know who you remind me of? he asked. Pygmalion. Do you know the story of Pygmalion? "'You mean the one in Bullfinch's mythology?' asked Vivian. "'You actually read that?' he asked, surprised. "'It was a book that she had borrowed from him, was it not?' "'Well, it took me many years to get to it, but eventually, yes,' she told him. "'You are full of surprises,' he said, smiling. "'Well, Pygmalion was a sculptor who had given up on women.' because none could meet his exacting requirements. In the end, he decided that he would use his art to create a sculpture of the perfect woman. When it was finished, not only did it have every element that he thought was needed for the woman of his dreams, but he also took his dream further and began to treat it as the living woman of his ideal. He spoke with her, dressed her, told her she was beautiful, and held her in his arms. He treated her as if she had already come to him. He was so devoted in his affection that even the gods were touched, and the great goddess Aphrodite took pity on him. When he next went to her shrine to leave an offering and to pray for his love to come to him, Aphrodite made it so that when he returned home, a magical change had come to the household. As had become his custom, he came inside and greeted his beloved, putting an arm about her waist and kissing her stone lips. Only this time, when his lips touched hers, her lips were warm and alive as she returned his kiss. 
he had dreamed her into life, Vivian said. He must have been very surprised when she became real. Yes, but as much as he had already imagined that very moment hundreds of times before, he must have been prepared for what to do when she finally arrived. I suppose I am hoping that the fact that I had a kitchen chair of my own even before I walked into your house also makes it less of a shock now that I may actually sit in it. He laughed. She sighed. Oh, you have no idea how good it is to hear your laugh and your voice, she told him. Now keep talking. Let's go downstairs, have coffee, and tell me about everything you did after New Orleans. I can't believe what an idiot I was then, calling the police on you. It's all right. You didn't know what to do, and I had given you more to absorb in a short amount of time than anyone could reasonably be expected to handle, he replied, waiting until she had walked through the door and out of the bedroom before joining her in the hallway and taking the wooden staircase downstairs. After New Orleans, I went to Rio de Janeiro, he said. What was in Rio? she asked. They went into the kitchen so she could make the coffee. Silence, the ocean, and relief. I was in bad shape, he admitted. After we parted, I ran straight to Mr. Gerstner and tried to get him to help me find you, but he wouldn't. I was very, very angry with him then, she said. I think I told him to go to hell. Gregory laughed. I'm sure that was not the first time he has heard that. They lingered in the kitchen until the coffee was ready, and then he helped her carry everything to the living room, where he dutifully sat down in his armchair and continued the story of what had befallen him since they had last been together. "'You lived with retired people in Florida?' she asked. Then later she asked, "'You went to Tibet?' And then, "'I still can't believe your house was swept away by a hurricane. "'You lived with hippies? "'What did you learn about them from being with them?' Gregory laughed. "'That they don't bathe very often.' "'Did you go in your suit?' Vivian wanted to know. "'In what else?' he asked. "'She shook her head in disbelief. "'I did buy some hippie clothing for my first visit to see the guru,' Gregory explained." "'A real guru?' asked Vivian with interest. "'Yes and no,' Gregory told her. "'He was not a real guru by training or through some kind of formal credentials, "'but he turned out to be the wisest and most helpful man that I could have hoped to meet. "'I have a lot I would want to tell you about him, but maybe we leave it for another time.' "'He looked at his watch.' The afternoon is moving along, and I will have to make the drive back to New York soon. I want to hear about you a bit also. Tell me about what you do at the flower shop. What is it that you enjoy about working there? Vivian looked thoughtful. People come mostly when they are in a good mood, buying flowers, and I provide a product and a service that they actually want. I'm standing at the register and handing them something beautiful as they are smiling. It is very satisfying, and it is a far cry from talking about life insurance or reading insurance policies. I wish now that I had had the financial freedom to always sell flowers. Maybe it is like Mr. Gerstner and his book repair store. Gregory smiled. Undoubtedly it is a similar thing, he said. Tell me all about what you did after we parted. I cannot put into words how much I have missed you, and how many times I have wondered what your life had turned out like. Well, there isn't much to tell, said Vivian, and she proceeded to give a very non-revealing three-minute overview of her last two decades. Gregory raised his eyebrows. That is all there is to tell, he asked her. Gregory, I'm sorry, 
but you expect me to be a chatterbox, whereas I haven't had to make this much conversation in the last six months put together. Give me time, she pleaded. He laughed. By all means, he said. We can also just sit here silently. It is wonderful as well. She was silent for a bit, and then slowly she began speaking again, telling him more details about the intervening years, telling him about how her mother had passed and how Sophie had grown up. It was like some stopped-up well within her that was starting to let some of her story trickle out, and he wondered what it was that she felt she had to keep so secret about after all these years. He had actual secrets that no one could know. But Vivian? What had made it so difficult for her to speak to anyone about the realities in her life? Compassion filled him at the thought of what hardships she must have gone through in the intervening years to become this turned away from the world. Behind last night's kiss, which hadn't changed at all, this Vivian had become a different and more scarred person. Ah, beautiful little Sophie, I think I did some damage there, Gregory sighed. Forgive me, Vivian. I did not realize that she was at an age already when she might take my friendship as some sort of romantic preamble. I figured as much, said Vivian. You have such strange notions of young girls. What did you tell Sophie to tell me? She mentioned you had told her something to tell me, only she was so angry and bitter with me by then that she would not say what it was. I have spent these years wondering. Probably just that you should know that I loved you, and that I had forgiven you all, so not to suffer over it any more, he told her. Now Vivian sighed. She was always exceptionally smart. She knew what a gift to me that would have been. Well, it's no matter. I have it from you now. She was angry with me and accused me of loving you more than I loved her. Well, what is the fault in that? Isn't that how it's supposed to be? Gregory asked. In my book, at least, the love of the couple comes first. Then it provides the sunshine that the young plants will grow from. But what would I know about it? I never had children. You had Sophie for a while, Vivian pointed out. Yes, but I always loved you more, he said earnestly. Their eyes met, and a happy spark passed between them. Do you ever travel back to New York, he asked her. Yes, not infrequently. I attend concerts and ballet performances now in the city, she told him. You do? Who do you go with? he asked. I go by myself. I enjoy the theater, but I have no one to go with me, she said. Well, that's decided then. From now on we must go together, he declared. A fine garden, the theater... How comes it that we have so much in common? Are you surprised, she replied. You partly raised me, you know. How could that be, Vivi? We never actually had all that much time together, he pointed out. She shrugged. In the time we did have, you were a huge influence on me. I've always looked up to you, I guess. Of course you have, he cried. I'm a solid twelve inches taller than you. They both laughed at this, and then he stood up. She looked stricken. Must you go? she asked. I must. I have things to attend to in New York tomorrow, he said. He led the way to her front door, and she followed. At the front door itself, they paused. Do you regret opening your door to me? He asked her softly. Never, she told him, shaking her head. But, well, we did rush into everything again very fast. 
Really? I think that after all these decades of loving you, this has rather been my slowest moving relationship ever, he said. We didn't think it through enough, despaired Vivian. I mean, how will we live? What will people say? How will this look? How is it all going to work? He reached out a hand and caught her upper arm gently. Dearest, this is not a situation for logic, but for the voice of the heart, which has a logic all of its own. We will take it one day at a time. He thought for a moment that she was displeased with him and that she regretted their passionate kisses from the night before, but then she looked up into his eyes. "'Can you come again next weekend?' she asked. He smiled. "'Come to see you every Saturday, like Cyrano came every week for years and years to see his beloved Roxanne. "'Yes, I can make myself available next weekend. "'Something tells me that I will be putting lots and lots of miles on this car of mine. "'Now be well, Vivian, until we meet again, which will be soon.' He opened the door, stepped through it, reached for her hand, and kissed it before walking down her porch steps and into his car. He could see her at the window of her living room as he pulled away, her body a slender shadow at the curtains, and then he thought he saw her wave goodbye. Gregory returned to New York and spent the next four days writing in his journal and documenting every single thing that he could recall of their twenty-four hours together. It was slow going because he fell into ecstasies at every memory. He called Ferdinand and told him that he had seen Vivian again, in fact, that he had just returned home. You spent the night there? Wow! Well, it seems like you two picked right back up where you left off. She is still alluring, then, even after all these years, asked Ferdinand. It was not as you insinuate, but yes, she is still alluring. You may find her to be imperfect if you met her now, but to me she is always beautiful beyond compare, Gregory told him. I did want to ask you a question, though. It always becomes very difficult for me once she falls asleep. I don't know if that is because her personality and her spirit aren't there in the room with me any more to protect the more animal, flesh, and blood part of her, or because of some other reason, but the, the temptations and the vulnerabilities seem to increase to an almost unbearable level for me. He felt terribly awkward to ask about these things, but he needed to know how they worked. Does this, um, happen for you also, when you are with your lady friends, that it becomes too much of a suffering and temptation to stay close once they've fallen asleep? Fallen asleep? Ferdinand echoed. Women don't fall asleep with me. I don't know, Morgan. Maybe you're doing it wrong. He followed this up with a hearty laugh at Gregory's expense. Then he said, Hmm, I see you are hoping for a more earnest reply. Well, sometimes it is difficult, but mostly these women don't really mean all that much. By the time I let myself be with a woman, I have already fulfilled my more acute longings elsewhere. And this is more for the warmth and the touch and the... the consolation, Gregory finished for him. Yes, that is a good way to put it, Ferdinand agreed. The entire evolving experience of being with women over the years has been interesting. At first, I was still able to lie with women, as a man, for a few years after I changed. But then it did end for me. I initially found that very upsetting, but then I discovered an unexpected thing, that now that my desires no longer came first, I became a better lover 
and more able to give women what they wanted. Women stayed longer, allowed me to take them back to my place more frequently, and gave more generously to me what I still needed. I don't know about you, Morgan, but when I actually was a young stallion, I was a damn pathetic lover. And I suppose I was always worried to offer very much because she might be dissatisfied, said Gregory awkwardly. He sighed. He could hear Ferdinand's smile straight through the telephone line. Take my word for it. They are never dissatisfied, he said confidently. Not if you are paying attention. Take your time. Whatever you are doing, do it right. In my experience, an appreciated woman is invariably generous in return. I cannot entirely believe we are having this conversation, said Gregory in half-horror and in a smothered voice. Ferdinand laughed again. Well, who else would you have it with? The other two medieval relics that are in your close circle? I don't know about Dita, but Wolf has probably not even spoken much to women unless it was unavoidable. We laugh now, Gregory pointed out, but you and I will have to grow up at some point and give up women, Ferdinand. Now that we are no longer men, this is all just a childish clinging to the past. If we keep on existing, I hear that eventually we turn into the kind of inhuman creature that no woman would ever be with. What are you talking about? Is this part of your newfound wisdom? Ferdinand wanted to know. You know what? Never mind, said Gregory quickly. Why give you nightmares? Thank you again for the romantic advice. He hung up the phone, lest the disturbing topic expand further. His second call was to Wolf, to tell him that he had found Vivian and that she had opened her door to him. He admitted now that he had gone to the Garden Club dinner a few weeks ago, and he thanked Wolf again for having found Vivian's contact information. "'So you are not disappointed with the reunion?' asked Wolf cautiously. "'No, not at all. How could I be? She is the love of my life. To have been able to see her again at all is incredible, and to have been able to return to friendship, well... That was almost beyond all hope for a long, long time, said Gregory. It is miraculous. Be careful, Gregor, Wolf told him. This is the same fire that you burned yourself badly on a few times already. I know, I know, but there is a key difference now, Gregory replied. And what is that? asked Wolf. Well, that I love her less than I used to because I now save up some of that love to love her all the better with in the spiritual realm, said Gregory. Vistas, come again? asked Wolf, confused. That I love the woman less as I love her soul more. Oh, you know what? Never mind, said Gregory. Only Atta would understand this. I have to write to Atta, Gregory thought. But the idea had vanished from his mind by the time he had finished his conversation with Wolf. He had to restrain himself, but managed to keep from calling Vivian until midweek. Then he called her at home to see when she wanted him to come and visit over the weekend. She sounded genuinely happy to take his call, and she told him that she had to work in the florist shop on most Saturdays. But then she asked if he would consider coming late on Friday again so that they could spend more time together. She could get a guest room ready for him, and he could leave his car in front of the store again. He smiled. She must not be as uncertain as all that if she wanted him to stay overnight again. He thought about explaining to her that he did not sleep any more, and so did not need a guest room readied for him, but then he reconsidered that it might be better to go over that in person. Even with his new calm and patience, the hours hung heavy on his hands as he waited for a Friday afternoon to arrive. When the time came at last, he got in his car and rode happily north, 
acutely aware that every mile was bringing him once more closer to her, and that this time she would for sure open the door to him. As it was already October, the onset of evening came quickly, and the sun was just setting as Gregory arrived at Vivian's house. He got out, knocked on her front door, and she opened it almost immediately. Her hair was pulled back in a conservative but timelessly elegant way. How stylish and beautiful she had become now, like a grand lady. Behind her, the square wooden staircase moved up like the staircase in a finer house, a bit perhaps like his mother, opening the door to him at Tant le Désiré, ages and ages ago. He suppressed the urge to kiss every centimeter of her lips and satisfied himself with kissing the palm of her hand passionately. "'Come outside,' he urged her. "'It is a beautiful evening. "'Let's walk before the sun completely sets.' She nodded, went inside and got a jacket, and then they strolled for a bit along her street beneath the dark orange of the sky. To walk with her again was a joy surpassing description. He adjusted his stride to hers as much as he could, and then slowed his pace to bring them the rest of the way into alignment. He asked her about her week and how it had been, and she told him, stealing sideways glances at him every now and then, and blushing. He wondered what that was all about. Then she asked him about life in New York City and where exactly he lived now. He patiently told her all about his new, small, interim place. He had thought to leave New York again once his training with the guru ended, to go south again. But now it seemed like moving closer to Connecticut would make more sense. He did not voice this out loud, lest she think him too presumptuous, but it had already taken root as an idea worth considering. It will be dark soon, she told him. We should go back, and perhaps you could move your car. He nodded, put the roof up on his convertible, and moved it to the front of the flower shop. Then he followed her inside the house, where they went together into the kitchen, so that Vivian could make herself a small dinner. "'I've been thinking about everything you told me last time,' she admitted. "'You have spent the years doing many different things, moving to different places. "'I have not done as much with my own life.' "'I don't know about that,' he said. "'You raised a child, had a successful career, "'bought a small business and a home, founded a garden,' Perhaps I did not give an accurate picture of my emotional state during much of that time. I was a sorry mess for much of it. I moved to Florida because I wanted to withdraw from life, and then the storm came and took my sheltered place away from me. I went back out into the world in very bad shape. I despaired. I ran away. I drank far too much. I left others to deal with what was left of my life, my identity, and my belongings. It was not my finest hour. Was it really all that bad, or are you exaggerating now? She wanted to know. I read your journal, but still. It was bad, he sighed. You may perhaps have imagined once that I might have made a good life partner, but that's only because we never really spent that much time together. In between the times we were together, there were some not very stable moments for me. I probably would have spent my time drunk on the sofa while you raised Sophie. Oh, please, Vivian said. I don't believe that for an instant. No, it's true. I rallied when I was with you, but mostly I was just stuck. In a way... To not have your face age is a terrible thing, but to not have your soul age or get any wiser is far, far worse. 
I did not know what to do or where to turn. I really believe that I lost my faith in my ability to communicate with other people. Everything got held inside of me, and then I ran in helpless circles for many years, Gregory told her. I think I know what you mean about holding everything inside of you, Vivian said. I have not spoken honestly to very many people either about what it has felt like to live my life. I have heard a lot as well, and I have not been able to rebound from the mistrust of others. There have been some very lonely hours in there for me, too. Ah, but you never gave up, he pointed out. I couldn't, she said practically. I had Sophie and my mother to look after. She stood up and cleared up after her dinner. He came to stand by her side while she washed her plate. Why are you smiling? he asked her. Because that is exactly where you always stand, when I am washing dishes, she said. You mean the ghostly me, who has lived here with you for a while now, he replied, smiling back. She nodded. Let's go and make a fire in the fireplace, and then sit and talk, she suggested. Oh, that sounds wonderful, he agreed. They got the fire going, and then they sat down side by side on the sofa and looked into its bright flames. How did you get out of that dead end? she asked. What made you stronger again? You mentioned about a guru last time. How did he help you exactly? He made a very big impact on me, Gregory admitted. He said we need to magnify our faith rather than our desire and that we need to focus on what we have rather than what we lack. I spent so much time and energy missing you and feeling miserable about that that I failed to notice that you were right there. My loneliness was an illusion. You seeing me standing beside you at the sink was closer to the truth than what I saw, which is that I was unloved and not understood by anyone in this world. Some people who are emotionally fragile have a tendency to anger, and in this way they can end up causing great hurt to those around them. Others who are emotionally fragile have a tendency to sadness, which ends up causing great harm to themselves. Not coincidentally, those are the two strongest emotions that exist anger and sadness. You can lose your senses in them and possibly never regain them. But love, asked Vivian. Gregory smiled. Love returns us to our senses, he said. Perhaps not the passionate love of the mortal plane, which is a closer cousin to anger or sadness than to holiness. But this is not real love. This is only reflected light. Real love is from the spiritual plane, and it lives deep within us and urges us to a more reflective and gentle way of living and feeling. It's funny. Love. One word, but so many meanings. Men and women love each other, but is it really the same thing passing in both directions? Is physical love the same as devotion? And is devotion the same as attention? And none of these is the love of the angels. Funny, we say we love someone, when what we mean is that we need them to love us, and in a specific way. One word and endless pitfalls. This is the shortcoming of language. This is the shortcoming of life, said Vivian. Yes, exactly. Life in this universe is built not of atoms, but of compromises, of which language is a fine example. Everything is almost perfect. That is the difference between this life 
and heaven, he said. But why would a perfect God build a universe made up of compromise? asked Vivian. Ah, how many have wished to know that. Probably because it best achieves its ends, which are love and holiness, he told her. Couldn't we have just started there already, with everything perfect and no suffering? asked Vivian with a frown. Well, no. You see, love is a dynamic force. You cannot start from there and then not move, he explained. All right, so then keep the love and I'll just take the holiness, said Vivian stubbornly. Gregory smiled. But God would not have it without the love. Who knows? Perhaps he is more of an impassioned poet, more like me. Vivian was silent for a while. You speak of spirituality like someone who has been born again. Do you go to church? She wanted to know. He shook his head. Hardly. I mean, would they even let me into a church, given what I am? No church is my shelter. No priest tells me whom to love or how. And no one need promise me some officially endorsed variant of salvation. I don't really need or want the comforts of the communal pew to keep me on my path of faith. In my own faith, there is silent space and room for unexplained things. My heart reaches for the deepest questions and is content with mystical, wordless replies. I reach this place after much self-harm and injury. What I'm really saying is that I despaired for a long time about the empty space inside of me before I discovered that I could make something useful out of it. And what is that? asked Vivian. A temple within myself for God to be present. A holy of holies, he said. I go there every day in my meditation. When do you meditate? asked Vivian. Do you wear a turban? Gregory laughed. No, I do not, and I also do not levitate over a bed of nails or any other such thing. I just close my eyes and sit quietly. Sometimes I listen to music. It's really not all that different from you and your pre jew I meditate at night. I go to bed or sit on a comfortable chair, close my eyes, and go to my sacred inner space to be with my beloved, which is, of course, also somehow you. Vivian looked at him with awe. And you can stay awake like that? I would be out like a light. How do you not fall asleep? Well, the thing is, I don't really sleep anymore, Vivi, he said. What? You never sleep at all? she asked, astounded. No. My face may not be changing, but other things about me are, and they are taking me further from the mortal life I once knew, he told her with a sigh. It is a good thing that I learned meditation now, because the nights seem much, much longer, and there's much more time to think about gloomy things and past regrets and even the end, although it is ostensibly still far away. Sometimes thinking is not a helpful thing. I thought for years that I was far away from you and miserable, for instance, and then it became my truth. Meditation is not following the random train of thoughts like this. Rather, it is either suspension of thinking, or else it is focusing on a specific neutral or positive idea. And what do you think of? she asked him. He turned to meet her eyes in the dim lamplight and fire's glow. Do you have to ask? he said in a gentle voice. I think of you, of being with you, 
and of the way it is when we are together and want nothing else in the entire world. I have put in much effort now and have gotten quite good at it. As a result, I have never loved you more or better than I do now. She looked like she had stopped breathing. He took advantage of the magic in the moment to lean toward her face, carefully remove her glasses, and kiss her temple. When he pulled back, he saw her blush beautifully for him. It made him feel numb and tingly and happy all the way down to his shoes. People often say things like, Keep going. Don't stop. You must stay strong. You must face your problems. And all that sort of thing. But you really can't face your problems all the time. Sometimes you need to run away and get some rest. And the only place to run to, without really running away, is to run into the center of yourself, which is what meditation allows you to do. Especially when I no longer sleep or dream, I have to find other ways to rest. Moreover, being a very emotion-prone person is exhausting, I have finally learned. He sat back against the sofa cushions again to give her her space once more. Then why don't you change? She wanted to know. You have to pick your battles, he said with a shrug. It isn't a good use of my energy to try to fight my personality head on. Moreover, I'm beginning to think that there are positive aspects to being an emotionally driven person given to touches of melancholy. Sadness and loneliness teach you beauty, gentleness, compassion, and poetry. You just can't let yourself drown in it. But I don't understand. Why would anyone want to be sad? Vivian asked. Because beauty and desire and love are close kin of sorrow. They have more in common with each other than with happiness. There is even great beauty in sorrow, and that is the realm of the compassionate angels. Angels, we are led to believe, are more elevated beings, capable of sensitively feeling every hurt and anguish of this world without letting the despair of it corrupt them. Men cannot do this. To dabble too deeply in the realm of the angels breaks our fragile hearts, he explained. Are you saying that those who are sad and sensitive are closer to the angels than are the hopeful and the well-adjusted? she asked. Well, yes. The dreamy, the artistic, the unsure. They are special people. They hold something precious and potentially amazing in their hands. For all we know, perhaps there is a certain amount of emotion to be felt and thus purged from this universe before it can be redeemed, and so these kinds of people may play a critical role in the salvation of all of creation. In that case, their personality is a gift, and I'm not sure that they should be cured of it. They only need to learn how to wield it, said Gregory. I think you are only saying this because you are defending your own personality type, said Vivian. Perhaps, he replied. But all I can say with certainty is that I respect this in myself now, in a new way, rather than wishing I could be like anyone other than me. I don't want it to go away, and Atta the guru, said that it wouldn't go away in any case. Sadness will occasionally find me, and that is all there is to it. The key for me is to remember that it is not the only state of being, and that it will always pass again. Atta also told me that I loved someone more than I loved you, 
and that that was the source of my problems. Was it the woman whose picture I once saw in your bedroom? Vivian blurted out, blushing again. Gregory was taken aback. No, it was sorrow that he was speaking of. The picture in my bedroom? You silly, jealous girl! Have you really been worrying about this for decades now? Vivian looked down at the floor. He could tell she was hurt. Vivi, that was my mother. It is the only drawing that I have of her. So naturally, it is one of my most prized possessions, he explained patiently. Your... your mother? she asked. Oh, what a fool I was. Who did you imagine she was? he wanted to know. I don't know. Some lady you had known before you changed. Or perhaps the one who changed you. Vivian answered him. Now it was his turn to frown. There was no one from before, and I hate the creature who changed me into this. She took advantage of me. I would never say that there was love there. The guru told me that I need to come to terms with her, or my fear and hatred of her would weaken me from within and erode my peace of mind. No doubt he was right. Do you think you might meet her again? asked Vivian fearfully. I am fully aware that if she was beautiful and lured you in back then, she is probably still around and looks exactly as she did once. But I am not the fool that I was back then, Vivian. I now have what I did not have then, which is better sense. I also have someone in you that I truly love. And now, most recently, I even have a new inner backbone, courtesy of Atta. He reached a hand over and smoothed it over her hair. Don't worry about her for even one minute, he said. I doubt I will ever even cross paths with her again. Vivian's face remained in a deep frown, and for a while they both gazed forward into the fire. Do you want me to tell you about this guru? It is a fairly good story, he finally said. All right, she agreed. Then take off your shoes. Sit back here with me, and listen as I tell you what I heard, he told her. She did as he suggested, and he draped an arm along the back of the sofa behind her back, cleared his throat, and began his tale. Well, once upon a time, in the hottest and most arid part of India, there lived a boy. Vivian listened to his entire story and then said, I can tell that meeting this Atta had an immense effect on you, but I still do not understand how this one friendship was strong enough to change you. How were you able to take on meditation every single day and never miss a day? There is more needed than just a good yarn to drive that kind of life change. You change when you want to change, he told her. When all of your passions go into it, and when you change your daily actions and thinking because of it, when you turn away from who you were because you finally understand that it does not take you closer to your goal. You are right. It is with incredible force of longing that you must want your goal in order to be firm enough to change the thousand small thoughts and decisions of your day that spring from your old nature and habits. You have to want your new goal like a man on fire wants relief. Until you are this serious about it, you will not be ready to walk away from who you always thought you were. For me, it was easy. I merely tethered my goal to the strongest idea I know, which was always to be with you in my heart. Anything that was at odds with that goal, why would I want it? I told myself that I was ready to ruthlessly throw overboard anything that did not keep me with you. 
After that, the rest was easy. He smiled. You are a hero, Gregory Morgan, she said, leaning her head into his shoulder and finally laying a cheek against him. I don't know about that, but hearing you say it sounds wonderful, he told her. They sat together in happy silence for a while longer, and then Vivian bade him good night and went upstairs to go to bed. She decided to keep the store closed the next day on a whim, and instead they spent Saturday walking around Lake Waramog once more and enjoying the fall foliage, and then the next day after that, sitting together in the garden in almost complete silence. Everything seemed to have come full circle, falling into place with a sweetness that took his breath away. Sunday was the fastest day ever, and then it was time to say goodbye again.